Welcome to this A-level sociology screencast for component one and in this video we're going to look at one of the most fundamental concepts uh, in sociology and that's the concept of culture. Just to quickly put this screencast in a wider context, what we're going to do over the next few weeks is give you a conceptual toolkit. We're going to have a look at some of the most basic ideas in sociology that really constitute the building blocks of this particular discipline. So in today's session we're going to look at culture and then we're going to move on and look at a range of other uh, key ideas that make up sociology as a subject. So the overall aim is to give you a toolkit of key sociological ideas that you can apply to the topics that come up uh, later during either your one year or two year study in this particular subject. And to get the most out of these screencasts, it's really important to watch them actively, uh, to take lots of notes, and I would suggest using the uh, Cornell note-taking method uh, that we taught you to use when you're watching these screencasts. So sociology, of course, is a social science that studies this relationship between uh, the individual and wider social forces, the wider society. So a key question is what links these two things together? Well, one of the most important things that links individuals to the wider society is a shared culture. Culture is a term used by sociologists to describe the shared way of life which binds individuals together into a society. And many sociologists would argue that it's a shared culture that really holds society together, that uh, having a shared way of life within society is really the basis of social order. So culture is a very broad analytical concept. Okay, This shared way of life uh, encompasses a whole range of social practices. Uh, it includes things like uh, shared language, uh, shared customs, uh, dress, as well as the symbols and artefacts which people develop uh, within their society. Two of the most important components of culture that sociologists are interested in are values and social norms. And we'll see later on in the course when we start to look at some theoretical perspectives that there are many sociologists who argue that a consensus, which simply means an agreement, on basic norms and values is really the social glue that holds society together. So let's briefly have a look at what these two terms refer to. Okay, firstly, values are more general and more abstract than social norms. So values are general principles or beliefs about the things that society sees as being good or bad or desirable. And that would include, uh, within our culture, the emphasis that we place on things like personal achievement, the sanctity of human life, etc. And actually in the previous screencast, when we were looking at baby names, one of the things that we discussed is how uh, the tendency for more variety now uh, with baby names is a reflection of the increasing value that society places on things like individualism and uniqueness. Social norms, on the other hand, are more specific and concrete than social values. So social norms are the guidelines or the social rules which define what is expected of individuals in certain situations. So that would include things like holding the door open for people, not interrupting when people speak, um, not jumping a queue. These are all examples of some of the more uh, mundane social norms that people are expected to follow uh, within our culture. Often we're not really aware of the extent to which our behaviour is guided by uh, norms and values. Uh, and that's because we become so immersed in our culture that the norms and values just become ingrained. They become uh, something that we do without really thinking about it. And therefore the key to being a good sociologist is to kind of stand back from your own culture and try to make the familiar strange. And this is something that the social anthropologist Kate Fox does uh, brilliantly uh, in her very readable book about English culture called Watching the English. 
and Fox argues that if we stand back and look at English culture from the perspective of an outsider, we can see that it consists of a set of shared values, and some of the values that Fox uh, writes about, often in quite a humorous way in her book, are things like the high value that we attach to humour, so English people like to uh, joke about everything, and irony in particular uh, is really valued as a source of humour. Uh, desire for order, and the particular manifestation of that within British culture is the sanctity of the queue. Okay, We get very grumpy and angry often when we see people uh, who don't respect uh, that desire for order. Uh, over politeness and courtesy it is another trait of uh, Englishness. So English people are always saying that they're sorry about things. They're always apologising. Uh, a sense of modesty and self-mockery. So we don't like the kind of brash approach where people boast about their achievements. The emphasis in English culture is playing things down and, and coming across as modest and being able to laugh at yourself. And then another really important value that Fox highlights, uh, which maybe accounts for the social awkwardness that English people often experience, is the value that we attach to privacy. And Fox argues that the value that we attach to things like privacy and politeness uh, leads to a whole range of uh, social norms. So in one section of her book, she talks about uh, the no-name rule. And what she argues is that the kind of brash American approach when you meet a stranger, uh, where you say, hi, I'm Bill, I'm from Iowa, uh, particularly if that's accompanied by an outstretched hand and a beaming smile, is something that we're not comfortable with as English people. It makes us wince and cringe. In English culture, she argues, rather than giving your name when you meet a stranger, the idea is that you strike up a conversation, uh, perhaps by making a vaguely uh, interrogative comment about the weather. And the object in English culture is to drift casually into conversation as though by accident. And eventually, if you begin to bond with that individual, there may be an opportunity to exchange names provided that this can be achieved in a casual, unforced manner. Another social norm identified by Kate Fox is something that she calls the long goodbye rule. And she writes in, in a book that if you're visiting an English home, be warned that you should allow uh, a good 10 minutes, and it could well be 15 or even 20 minutes, from those initial goodbyes to your final departure. So this is about the emphasis that we place on politeness within our culture. So to simply say goodbye and then leave immediately is seen as being impolite. So for that reason, uh, our farewells tend to be a more drawn out process. So what Kate Fox's book shows us clearly is that social values and social norms are closely related. So for example, because we emphasize the importance of privacy in English culture, that leads to social norms such as the no name rule. Because we emphasise the importance of politeness, that also gives rise to a whole range of social norms such as the long goodbye rule. Now sometimes norms and values are bundled together and they're attached to particular roles or customs within society. So a social role uh, is really the expected pattern of behaviour associated with a particular uh, social status. So, for example, if you think about occupational roles, think about what you would expect from a teacher, the whole set of rules that define how teachers should behave uh, given that particular occupational status. And then customs are the kind of norms, the expected behaviour that we associate with a particular context or situation. And this is perhaps clearest if we think about very formal situations such as weddings and funerals where there are a whole range of norms associated with things like dress and demeanour that people are expected to follow in those particular situations. Now so far implicit in this uh, presentation is this idea that there's a mainstream culture that everybody shares uh, within our society. 
And of course we know that that isn't the case, that our society is in fact very culturally diverse and there are particular groups within society that might have their own distinctive norms, values, roles and customs that are different from the mainstream culture. And the term that's generally used in sociology to describe these groups with their own kind of distinctive uh, norms and values is we refer to these groups as subcultures. For example, later on in the course, we look at a variety of youth subcultures that have developed their own distinctive dress, their own distinctive ways of speaking, their own distinctive norms and values that have made them stand out uh, from the mainstream culture of their society. And of course, there's loads of evidence of cultural diversity if we compare different types of societies. What might be regarded as, as normal in one society might be regarded as unnatural and abnormal in another society. And we use the term cultural relativity to describe these differences. And one obvious example of cultural relativity would be food. So within our culture, we wouldn't see uh, dogs as uh, a source of food. Whereas, of course, in some other cultures, such as Vietnam and South Korea, you can go into a restaurant and, and dog uh, alongside uh, other meat dishes will be on the menu. So to test whether or not you understand the material that we've covered in this screencast, uh, check that you can now define what sociologists mean by culture. Uh, check that you can also describe the main components of culture, particularly uh, things like norms, values, roles and customs. And there are a few other terms that we've also used uh, during the course of this presentation. See if you can describe in your own words what is meant by cultural diversity, what's meant by a subculture, what we mean by cultural relativity. And what we're going to do in the next screencast is continue looking at culture by looking at the ways in which culture is transmitted. And we're going to do that by focusing on the concept of socialisation.